Hi, my name is Luke Parnell, and today I'm here to introduce uh, Northwest Coast Master Carver, Dempsey Bob. Here he is, right here. Um, Dempsey has taught and lectured and produced art throughout Canada, the United States, Europe, New Zealand, and Japan. He was a leader in establishing the Frida Deesing School of Northwest Coast Art in Terrace, BC. His work is in major collections in the, Muse the Canadian Museum of Civilization, UBC's Museum of Anthropology, the Columbian Museum of Ethnology, the Smithsonian Institute, the National Museum of Ethnology in Japan, Canada House in London, and the Vancouver Airport. He has been featured in several video productions and publications, such as The Smart One, In the Hands of the Raven, and Faces in the Land with Dempsey Bob Carver. He received an honorary doctorate of laws in 2011 from the Athabasca University, as well as an honorary doctorate from Emily Carr University of Art and Design. He recently was named an officer of the Order of Canada. As a master Teltan Clinket artist, Dempsey Bob has contributed to the revitalization and the perpetuation of Aboriginal art in Canada for the past 30 years. Today, he is a celebrated BC Aboriginal artist and a de dedicated teacher. Ladies and gentlemen, Dempsey Bob. And we're gonna start off by showing, um, uh, we're, start, start, we're gonna start off by showing a 30 minute video, thanks. I am Dempsey Bob, Caltan Clinton artist from Telegraph Creek, BC. It goes down to there, but it gets pretty slippery down here. It's a little rainforest here. I like to come here to look at the mountains and the trees. I'm inspired by just being in nature, being out there. It takes the stress away from you too. When you, you get too busy and then it calms you down. It's a healing thing, I think. This is the time that we go and get our wood for carving when it's dormant. drawings of little baby killer whales that are locking with the large, the large killer whales. I put it on that house and we got some of our students to paint it. We're going right back to the classic Northwest Coast style. Of 
growing up in Port Edward, there was no television. So we drew and we carved, we used to carve our own toys. That's where I got started. I quit for a while and then I went back. In 1969, I met Frida Deesing and went to her class. I got it some good shows and then I got my pieces in Ottawa, the National Museum, and I got some pieces in UBC. People see it, people see it, and that's how my work got known. When I was young, I used to see faces in the mountains and in the forest, and, and then I stopped talking about them because people thought I was weird. And then now, being an artist, I see them again. It's like the land talks to me. That's when we lose living in a high-tech society. We lose that connection to the land. And so that's what our students, this is our future generation. We want to ensure that we have one. I've done a lot of teaching. And teaching to me inspires me and gets me going too. The young people, we're trying to get across to them how important the land is and how important our culture is. I look at my life now and it sort of things fell into place for me. I was lucky. I think it's just a time. I grew up in the 50s in Port Edward and there was a lot of elders there and they told us stories. I would wish I had listened more. We call this creek Fog Woman's Creek. The fog woman story is about Raven traveling and he got lost in the fog and he met this beautiful woman and she took off his hat and all the fog went into his hat. And then he found his way back to the village and then he found out that she had salmon. So he married her to get the salmon. And after he became wealthy, he mistreated her. And so she left him. And as she was leaving, she called back the salmon that she gave him. He said all the salmon in the smokehouse went down to the creek and the river and came back to her. And he was chasing after her and he's trying to grab her. As he grabbed for her, she turned to fog. We like to carve all the when it's fresh, when it's cold. It's going to be a small portrait mask, and I might make it into a sculpture. I don't know yet. I'm just thinking about it. What I do is I look at the shape of the wood, and 
I have all these ideas and then I try to fit the one that fits into the piece of wood or shape. And sometimes I let the shape of the wood tell me what to make. The land talks to me through the trees and the mountains. Because wherever you live affects the way you are and what you do. Also the way you see. I think an artist, you gotta be connected to the land. Because the land is magic. The land is spiritual. Our people have always been close to nature and we learn from the animals and we learn from the land. We say like our ancestors, you know, they go back to our land. And that's what I see, the faces in the land. It's our ancestors. We say that if you lose contact with the land, your spirit gets lost. That's what inspires me, like this mountain, I call it the magic mountain because it changes all the time. Each time I see different faces. Here, you look at the mountains, you look at the trees, you look at the rivers, everything's big. It's sculpture country. Our technology was wood. Our people were extraordinary woodworkers, you know, carvers and carpenters. They did everything. I like to go and choose my own alder, and I look for trees that are in really good locations and ones that grow inside so that there's not very many knots for about 10, 15 feet up and then branches out. And I'll find a nice shaped tree and it's, it saves a lot of time on the roughing and shaping of it. You usually get the alder when it's dormant. And so you really, you really have to know your trees too. You see the red stain on this wood? That's from the sap. The sap comes up in the wood, we say. And what, what happens now when the leaves are gone, all the sap is out of the wood. So it doesn't stain very much. And what I'm doing here, I had a small piece that I cut off the back of a mask, and so it was so nice wood that I wanted to make something. So I, I made this sort of small piece, but now what I'm doing, I'm taking it in to make it more sculptural, to bring it out. And what I did on the top was a little human uh, part hawk, and then the hawk here with his wings coming up here, and then the eagle coming out of the mouth, and then this is the human here. And our, our traditional way is that we, we wear our crest on our, on our forehead to show our clan symbols. I get it to a point where 
it's almost like it, it, I want it to tell me how to finish it, and then I do it. And then when I finish it, it seems like they, they've got their own life, then they have to leave. is that our art is old. It's thousands of years old. And it comes from here. They come from these forests. They come from these mountains. They come from these hills. Now what I'm doing, I'm doing the final sanding and finishing and painting on it. This one's uh, it's 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 a raven for it mask. Yeah, it's got a frog on the top, and the frog is the helper of the raven. The raven is a trickster, and he was also a teacher too. The stories where that like when when he was traveling, they said after the flood the people were very intelligent, but they started using it against each other. So, say that the great spirit scattered the people all over the world. But he, different groups landed on different mountains. And that's when Raven brought the light to the world. And when he brought daylight. Represented knowledge, teachings. You have to feed yourself, you know, with knowledge, with being in nature. And what happens as artists is you're giving, you're giving. All your energy goes into what you're working on. And you get empty. And you got to fill it up with something. I like coming out to see the land, to be in the forest, to see the mountains. They fill me up and then I'm good for a while again. Most people like, you know, you work and work and work all your life and a lot of them you never realize what you really can do, where your potential is. And as an artist, you gotta keep pushing, keep pushing. Because like in art, you can't just have talent. Talent is cheap. It's the dedication that's costly, and the commitment, and the hard work. You gotta be able to do the hard work. It's really nice when you start to get it close and it, it's like it's, you can see the progress on it and it's getting better and it looks more real. On a major piece like this one, it's, it's, it's nice to get it close and finished.
I don't want the paint to take away from the sculpture. So I'll just paint the eyes. And I don't know, I just sort of evolved into using less and less paint. I have my own style, but it's hard to explain. It's the eyes, I think. I've been trying to carve these eyes I've seen for 20, 30 years now. It's become my style. Most people are blind. They look, but they don't see. Artists train themselves to see and feel. To find your style, to find your art, you gotta go where nobody has gone, and you gotta go by yourself. As artists, you could go so far in your learning, but eventually, you gotta go your own way. I think the hardest part was getting it inside of this taking that out, getting a nice shape in there, and thinning it, that was the tricky part. Um, and getting the nice shapes in there, like sweeps, and the depth, you have to get the depth in the right places. nature from our people, from our culture, because we're all connected. We're connected to the animals, we're connected to the environment. You know, it took us a long time to revive the art, and if we don't teach, it could be gone in another generation. passing on what we know. It's like like my whole life has been teaching and carving and, and if we don't pass this on, what does my life mean? Art is the conscience of society. And great art comes from good people, great cultures. What I realize about art, art doesn't lie. If it's not in you, it's not in it either. It's like when I'm carving, it's like there's somebody with me. What I'm doing, I'm carving for my teacher, and I'm carving for my ancestors, and I'm carving for my grandfather, and I'm carving for my people that weren't allowed to. That's why it's important. It's a big responsibility. I realized like this gift that I have, it's not given to everyone. So you gotta use it and use it well. I share it.
Thank you. I think I said it all in the movie. <laughs> I, I started carving about 1969. And when I started, I didn't say I was going to be an artist. And I started with a lady called Frida Deesing. And she was incredible teacher. And I was lucky because I was ready to learn. And as a small child, we used to carve in Port Edward because we had no money, so we carved our own toys. And there was no television, there was no computers, there was no nothing. <laughs> and we drew. And we listened to stories from our ancestors, from our, from our elders. And I was lucky, I was born into this family, like my grandmother is Clinkett, she's from Atlin. She comes from the Ward family. Her father's name was Judson Ward, and he was, he was a Clinkett carver from Huna, Alaska. And he made the goat horn spoons and the sheep horn spoons. And he made things for my grandmother when she was a small child. My grandfathers are from Tal Telgraph, Taltan. So my mother's part Taltan, part Clinkett. And my grandfathers are Taltan, and my, on my grandmother's side, we're all Clinkett. And I was lucky I was born in this family because my grandmother's mother was a basket weaver too. So I got some stories from my, my grandmother and from my grandfather, Johnny Sinkoots. And I was lucky I listened, I, I, I listened to the stories. And this is one of the stories he told me of the first mask, this mask. He told me a story about a man. They called him the smart one because he, he kept the stories. He was the keeper of the stories. And I, I seen him one day and I just drew him out. Like, I'll draw all the time. And I don't say, well, today I'm going to be creative. I live it. I, I think about it all the time. I keep it in the back of my mind. And what I do is like, I, I know certain things that work for me, like I read a lot. I, I, I find if you stop learning as an artist, you stop being an artist. And a true artist, you have to master drawing, you have to study, and you have to do a lot of work, you have to do the exercise. And what I realized that, like in our school, the best drawers are the best painters. The best drawers are the best carvers because the drawing trains you to see. That's what I'm talking about, seeing. Like that mountain I was talking about, I brought my Maori friend from New Zealand, Darcy Nicholas. You know what he saw in that mountain? He saw Maori faces. And he, he saw a Maori dog, a war dog that they used to use in the war. And he went back and he painted that. And this guy, like, like what I realized in art, like I went to New York, I went to the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Early in the morning, I went there early because people are, there's 10,000 people there. So I went early in the morning and I looked, I looked at Monet's water lilies and the light was hitting it just right. And you know what I saw in those water lilies? I saw masks, hundreds and hundreds of masks and I was just struck like this. Oh, he smokes and I started looking. I was looking at all these masks and then it, then it sort of, I snapped out of it like that and I said, he didn't paint masks. He didn't know any masks. But I saw what I knew. And that's what I meant, that you only see what you really know in art and life too. And if you don't train yourself to see, it don't wait for you. And it won't even look at you. And that's what artists do. You have to train yourself to see, to really see. And I was lucky because I I, I had Frida, and Frida made us learn how to draw. We had to learn to draw. And how Frida did it for me was that she sent me to Alaska to teach. And then I realized, like talking to uh, Phil Jensey, he said, uh, you know, we actually taught for nothing. Because when we went to Alaska, I had to carve them a mask to be able to teach in their, in their uh, at the museum. I had to carve them a mask and give them a mask to teach. And I had to do it in one day, but I did it. Anyways, those pieces we gave them are worth more than we ever got paid for. So that's why Phil Jensen said we, got, we, we work for nothing. <laughs>
And he said, we did it because Frida told us to, he said. Because Frida said, <clears throat> and we went. And I realize now why she did it for me, because that's where my people are, too. I've got relatives in Alaska, Clinkett side, on the Clinkett side. And I met some, and I, I, I started working with them, and I learned some of our songs and our stories. And, I, and I, it was really great opportunity for me. And what I realize now is that she was really smart because that made me do my homework. I was drawing and drawing. I learned to draw a salmon from a little girl that was about 10 years old in, in Huna, Alaska. And she could really draw because she had innocence and she had the wonder and she, she was just open. And, and, and I learned how to draw an eagle's beak from an elder there that made blankets. Showed me how to draw the eagle's beak. But I learned, I went there and I learned and a true artist is this, you have to do your homework. There's no other way. Because what happens, the truth of art today is that you can't mature as an artist if you didn't do your homework. And that's the truth of it all. And that's why there's so many problems. Artists have so many problems. You've got to do your homework. And how I did my homework was teaching the children, drawing and drawing and drawing. That's what Vincent van Gogh meant, that you have to draw like your life depended on it. Because artists have always been seeking the magic line. The magic line is the perfect line. It's the, it's the line that has life. The trouble with most sculptures today, they're like this. They're standing apart like this. And they're stiff. And they got no life. It's because people can't draw. <laughs> you can't, you gotta get that motion in there. The motion, the movement, the proportions, everything is in the drawing. Drawing is the foundation of art. It's the language of art. Um, that piece, the smart one, it was, I did that one about 1989. I, I got the idea and I, I drew it down one Sunday morning real fast. I, I'll draw, sometimes I'll draw eight hours just drawing, just drawing. Things will come to me. Sometimes I'll think about a story or somebody will tell me a story or I'll see something or I'll see something in the clouds sometimes, sometimes in the water, sometimes on the mountains. And then I'll start seeing things and it's sort of like these things, images start coming to me and I'll start drawing down real fast. I, I find you got to do it really fast because you lose that feeling, you lose it. So I, I try to draw really fast and I just get them real fast, then I clean them up later. And then I'll work on them. And what, what I've been doing with this one here, I started that piece and then I, I was working in my basement and I had, a, I had a workshop bench and I had a little light, a little window. I put them on there and I went up to get some coffee and I came back down, I turned the lights off and I, he was sitting there in the dark and, he, and then I, I was just gonna turn the light back on and I looked at him and he was looking at me really strong and I said, holy shit, he's there. So I just left him. I just left him. And then I sort of just let him finish himself. I just, I, I studied him and I let him finish himself. And then I realized when I finished him that he was smarter than me because he it ended up exactly the way he wanted to be. And then I thought about it. It doesn't matter because he's better than I ever thought he, he would be. And he was bought by a, a collector that was on the, board of the Museum of Modern Art, and he bought out one of my shows, and he bought 40 pieces, he bought 40 pieces of my work, and um, he didn't even come, he just sent his agent to buy it, but uh, this guy, when I look at him now, he looks he, totally different from what I thought of what I did when I worked on him, but that's the way it's supposed to be, I think. But now I think I'll be remembered by him, the smart one. Okay. I did this mask too, it's a wolf mask. It's one of our stories about the, a wolf. And it's about the woman that uh, she ridiculed the wolves and she married a wolf. And it's part of our history of our clan, how we got the wolf in our, our family. And that's one of, one of the wolf's sons riding on the, on the wolf headdress. That's made out older. That, that, uh, that's the mask when I finished it, it's the raven, the raven and the frog mask. 
most of my pieces are made out of alder, and um, when I when I work in alder, I, I work in green when it's when it's wet. And we get it when it's when the trees are dormant, and I do a lot of. Uh, I study the trees too. You got to know the trees. You got to know the wood. You got to know where it grew, because if it grew in the water, it's going to be rotten in the middle. If it grew out by itself, it, there's too many limbs, too many knots, too many branches are broken inside the wood, so you, you won't get good wood. So you got to know the the trees too. These masks I did for a show. It's um, it was at the Grace Gallery in 1989, and. This is the show that uh, I sold the whole, the whole collection to one, one, one uh, collector. When I, when I work on ideas, like I, I'll start this one here, that's actually a spoon, the frog is a spoon. It comes off of there, and this is a feast bowl with the raven and the frogs. And this was one of my nicest designs. But I went to school like in 1972 in Hazleton, British Columbia, and then I had to drop out because uh, we were starving and I had no money. So I went back in 1974 and I did the advanced carving. And after that, I've just studied it myself. And as art, art is you got to keep, you got to find your own way. And that's what I've always done. Because like, I'll talk about a little bit about my family and about um, when I went to school. Why we left our home was because they they were trying to take us to the residential school. That's why we left, and they took my my older brothers and sisters, and why I teach because we weren't allowed to do it. And I said, why? Why should we let our beautiful art die? That's why I'm teaching. OK. <clears throat> I mean, I worked in jewelry. I, I've done a lot of jewelry too. And I've taken some of my sculptures and what I realized that you've got to learn sculpture. Sculpture is what gives things life, the depth, the feeling. And I found that I like jewelry, but I love sculpture. And what I think you have to do what you do best. And, and, and the sculpture is always, it was always with me. I felt it, and uh, when, when I when I got into jewelry, I I did it for quite a while, and then I decided that I was going to go into to sculpture because I was going to do jewelry when I get old. <laughs> because jewelry too is a it's an art form, and if you're going to be good at jewelry, that's all you're going to do. And if you're going to be good at sculpture, that's all you're going to do. Because there's only so much time. OK. I got into bronze, too. I went to Italy. And uh, when I was over there, I met this guy from Australia. And he said, you know, like, he said, what, what are you doing here? What, why did you come here to be like Michelangelo? And I, I just looked at him, because I, something really bad was going to come out. <laughs> Because I can't be Michelangelo, you got to be who you are. I'm a, I'm a Caltech, I'm a Clinket artist. I'm, I, I know who I am, and that's who I am. And 
I could never be Michelangelo. And why? Why should I be? But I wanted to learn their techniques just to put it into bronze because I need a new challenge. I probably did about 600, 700 carvings in wood. And I think you've got to change or you're going to go crazy. <laughs> this one uh, Haida artist, he said, you know, if I have to carve another eagle and raven bracelet, I'm going to puke, he said. <laughs> and that's how I felt, too. <laughs> when I was doing earrings, I, I, I couldn't do them anymore. I was going to puke. And at Christmas time, all the women, that's all they wanted was earrings. <laughs> but I was lucky too, like I, I met some really good artists and I, I participated like at the Commonwealth Games in 1978 in Edmonton. And I worked with artists from Africa, India, Australia, England, all the Commonwealth countries. And we lived together and we told stories, like our stories, I told our stories. and. I've seen the familiarity of all indigenous peoples all over the world. And so I've always been interested in traveling and sharing, and I've been working now with the Maoris from New Zealand, because their culture is so similar to ours, and it's so neat. And now, you know, like starting this school, we, we, I felt that Frida didn't get her full recognition as, a, as an artist, so we named the school after her. And because traditionally women in our culture, they didn't carve. And the women didn't even come around the carvers while they're carving. That was our tradition. But she was the only school we had. She was our only, tea, you know, only place we could learn at that time. And we were hanging on by a thread, and Frida was our thread. And anyways, what Phil said about the teaching in Alaska was he said that we did it for the love of Frida. That's why we did it all that teaching. And she was smart too because like what Frida did to me was like after I got out of Kassan and then she said, she, I kept trying to learn from her and then she, one day she kicked me out of the nest anyway. She said, uh, I've taken you as far as I can, she said. If you want to go the rest of the way, you got to go by yourself. And that really made me mad because she kept teaching Donnie Omens. So I was always competing with Donnie Omas. <laughs> but anyways, that was the best thing she could have done for me because I realized that I had to find my own way anyways. And then I had to find my own art and my own truth. And it's like art is like this. It's like, it's like, uh, it's like the blues. You can't play the blues if you didn't live it. What are you going to say? What are you going to express? You've got to know that. You've got to have the feelings. You've got to have the experiences. You've got to have the knowledge. You've got to have the talent. But, you know, like, like talent is only a part of the gift. There's about three parts, four parts to the gift. The other part of the gift is there's knowledge, there's talent, there's a work ethic, and the other part is passion. You've got to find your own passion. And your own passion has to be real. Otherwise, you can only go so far. And then you're stuck. And actually, I think, in a way, artists, you actually hold yourself back. It's even your, your lifestyle. It's your thinking. It's even your learning. It's like what I'm going to try to do is something really different. OK? I'm going to make this sculpture really different. Sometimes I'll start it upside down. I'll start upside down because if I start it the same way and use my same processes, it looks up like my other work. It looks the same as my other work. So what I do, I try to trick myself into thinking different and starting it different and inventing whole new ways of working so that it ends up different again. And that's really tricky because if you fall back on what you know, it looks the same again. Because you're, you're using your same processes. So this, these are some of the challenges I, I challenge myself. I always try to challenge myself. Like when I'm thinking about ideas, like for bowls or masks, I think about bowls inside of bowls. And I've made masks with rattles inside of rattles inside of the bowl, in, 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 inside of a bowl, and rattles inside of masks in sculptures.
I try to think really different and I, I, I draw a lot. And I, what works for me on the creative part is I, I read a lot. I read all kinds of stuff and I find it gets me going, gets me going. I can read about other artists too. And it inspires me and I travel. I like going to New Zealand. New Zealand is a really beautiful, powerful country. And it, when I come back from there, I'm energized. I'm renewed and I can work again. And then I'm filled up again, like, and that's why I go there. Okay. I've been, I've been making these pieces and some of them are getting, they're getting longer and longer and some of them are getting bigger too. But this is older. I don't know why I like carving frogs. I don't know, but my grandfather told me a lot of stories about frogs and, and as children, you're not supposed to mistreat them, and if you do, you get bad luck. We call it AE, which means it's really bad, and you're gonna get punished, okay? I did the fog woman, and I carved her in a year, and I, oh, it took me one year to carve her, and it, I spent all my time with her, and I, she ended up different than I thought, too. But it's a story, it's a story about the raven and the, and the salmon. And the fog woman had two beautiful daughters and the, they were so beautiful that that's why the salmon come back to the rivers to spawn, just to see them one time before they die. And she had this basket that she could put her hand in and take out a salmon and that's her basket you'll see on the side there. That's the salmon coming back to her. And we say when she combed her hair, she combed out salmon out of her hair. And that I used her hair as water. And that was the hardest part is to get the hair to look like water. But I, I've done about 20 big totem poles and I wanted to do a, just a three dimensional sculpture. So I did the fog woman, she's six eight and the raven is carved out of red cedar. <clears throat> I moved them raven away from her because he was he's a little bit taller than her and he was sort of dominating her and they wanted me to put her on this pedestal but I said no so we moved him we moved him down finally but she's, we say that she lives at the head of the creek and that she's carved out of yellow cedar and ravens carved out red cedar the red cedar is our spiritual tree it's our spiritual tree and yellow cedars are one of our main, main carving wood. It's one of the best carving wood in the whole world, okay? I've been doing these sculptures now and what, they gave me this piece of wood in, in New Zealand and I had this idea in my head and it didn't work, it couldn't work. It was a, I was gonna do a warrior. The theme was this, we were doing warrior sculptures and I wanted to do a Tlingit warrior with his helmet and his visor and his face. And so what I did was I, I switched it. I put the center line on the corner of the wood because the wood was only this wide and it was about that long, that long. So I switched it and I, then I could get the scale that, that I wanted in it. And from that I, I, started, I started these sculptures. They're like uh, wall sculptures. They're quite large there. And I had this one dream one time and I seen this mask and it was faces were bubbling up right over the top and right around the back and it was just coming out all over the place. And ever since then I seen how the pieces went together, how the faces fit, how they should go, how you could draw them, how they would fit into the piece. And that's what I've been doing with this piece here. Like there's an eagle transforming there and there's an eagle up top and humans and these are transformation down here too, faces. I've been, I don't know, I've been obsessed with faces. I, I see them, I see them and they, they come to me. Sometimes just before I go to sleep though, I'll start seeing these things and I have to get up and draw them otherwise they don't leave me alone. And sometimes if I don't do something, they turn ugly so I gotta get up and draw. 
okay? This is a birch, it's about, and it's gonna hang. It's gonna hang, it's gonna hang, and it's a beaver. It's hollow inside. It's hollow inside and I thinned it all out and I glued it all back together and there's a woman on this side here. This birch comes from Saskatchewan. I've been working with some artists out there. We've been working together on different sculptures. This piece is quite long, it's quite long, it's, it's, it's all frogs again too. I'll get an idea and then I'll just start, I'll start, I'll start, like I started on top, I seen this, this big guy, I seen him first, and then I'll, I'll start fitting it in. Sometimes I don't draw the whole thing, but I have an idea, I'll have an idea in my mind. And what I do is if I don't, I don't make it final, the design. I'll change it. If I have to change down here, I'll do it. If it's, if it's gonna get be better, it's the only rule, it's gotta be good, it's gotta be better, I'll do it. I'll leave my mind open until I get it close. But this, I'll draw this whole thing on just freehand, like I draw it freehand. And I find that's the best way to work, is freehand, right on the piece. Because you're working, you're not working with a drawing, a flat drawing, trying to wrap it around it. You're working right with a piece. Okay. This one here is a bear mother story, and that's the bear on the bottom, the bear mother and the cub there. And I carved this, I carved him right through, like I sculpted him right out, right out of the piece. And I've been getting into these little sculptures and trying to push it, really push it. And you see how it emerges from the wall. The, these sculptures are just emerging from the wall. And I really like that idea. I, it, it's sort of, I'm using sculpture, are still coming from our tradition, but stories, but pushing it in a different way. And it's different challenge. And it's, what, what I'm doing now is like, if it's not a challenge to me, I don't wanna do it. I just don't wanna do it. Okay. This one here, I, I started this one and I was gonna, we we're gonna do a collaboration with one of my Maori friends, but we didn't work out. So one day I went downstairs and I drew the top the big the eagle on top with a little man, he's traveling, he too. And the eagles are our stories is the eagles came from the north, came from our culture, from our people in the north. And that's the eagles, that's the eagles coming. That's the little guy in the bottom there with the eagle. He's holding an eagle and the little man in the bottom here. And that's the eagle head there in the, in the middle, the main part. I, I, I did, um, I probably did about 20 totem poles now. And so what I've been trying to do now is I've been trying to change and challenge myself. And I've been working on some different bent boxes now and panels and all kinds of um, carvings. I've, um, I've made um, probably I said about six, seven hundred pieces in wood. And what I'm doing now is I've been working with the Maoris, experimenting with their wood and learning from them, learning their tools. They use a lot of chisels and gouges. We use our traditional adzes and bent knives. And what was really neat about Frida was she taught us our traditional tools with the bent knives and traditional adzes. And we didn't have very many gouges because we didn't have no money to get them. So what we did was we, we just made our own tools. We made a lot of our own tools. And I was, you know, like myself, I, I didn't, when I started, I didn't say I was gonna be an artist. I just sort of kind of led that way. And now I realize too, like I, my grandmother, my mother, they told me stories and they kept telling me stories and they chose me. 
and they knew I was going to do something, but they didn't know what it was. And now I realize now that they, they told me all those stories because they knew I was going to do something, and they knew I was going to be an artist. And I don't know how they knew, but they knew. And they chose me, and they did it. And then I remember those stories, and that's what I've been carving, that's what I've been doing. And we, you know, people, we, there's, a good, there's a big discussion today, like I'll just want to talk about contemporary and tradition. They always want to put us in the traditional side with the dinosaurs, but we don't fit. <laughs> because if you understand Northwest Coast art, it's some of the greatest sculpture ever done at any time by any nation at any, anywhere in the world. That's how great it is. And the modern artists were inspired by Northwest Coast, not only Northwest Coast, but Aleut art, African art, because it was great art. Great artists are not inspired by junk. And what they stole from us, modern art stole from us, is freedom, freedom of forms. Like our, our pieces, one story could be a mask, could be a bowl, could be a song, could be a story, could be a canoe, could be a house, could be a box, could be a bowl, could be anything. And, you know, we talk about modern art. This is some of the things we talk about as artists, okay? Like, I talk with artists all over the world. Like, we had these discussions, like in England, New Zealand, Japan, London, what was modern art in the beginning? Modern art was the rebellion against the institutions and teachings of that time. Like what, what if Vincent van Gogh came back and seen what we're teaching? Because what he rebelled against and what he died for has become the institutions of today. Think about it. So how do you teach rebellion? You can't teach rebellion, it has to come from inside. And, you know, that I think about our pieces, like when you understand, really understand our old pieces, they were more contemporary than us. When we talk about contemporary art or traditional, one t at one time, everything was traditional. Everything. It was traditional to that time. And everything was one time contemporary to their own time of, of making. When they made that art, it was contemporary to that time. It became traditional through time and use and belief and acceptance of the people. That's what makes it traditional. Also, when you talk about traditional and contemporary now, if you really understand art, True innovation has to come from tradition. It has to come from the traditional art forms. It's like this, like if you think about Picasso and those boys, their ancestors were the Greeks and Romans. Their tradition was the European art history and theory. So that was their tradition. They knew that tradition. They could draw you or me perfect, but they chose to do this. And they could make it work because they, they knew their tradition. They came from that tradition. And they were great artists from that tradition to be able to do it in a new form, in a new idea, a new way. And that's what they did. And that's what my people did too. If you understand our art now, the great old art pieces, they're in New York, they're in Moscow, all over the place. They're in uh, St. Petersburg in Russia. But that is some of the greatest sculpture ever done. If you understand it, it's like this, like they were more contemporary than us. And if you understand now what's happening today, we're actually the primitive ones. Because we got the tools, but we don't have the knowledge. We don't have that knowledge that they had. And that's the difference. <laughs> that's the difference. And what we've been, what we've been trying to do is just try to get back to that level, to the level of our ancestors. But I don't think we'll ever get there. I mean, well, maybe somebody, somebody will get close. <laughs> maybe, I think. But I think, like, my idea now is 
I'm thinking about where would the art have gone if our people didn't stop? If they didn't stop for all those years, where would it have gone? And I want to go there. There's, when you think about it, there's nowhere else to go. And what I meant about you have to go your own way, that's where your truth is. That's where your style is. But you got to earn it. And it's by your study, and it's by your hard work, it's by your experiences, it's by your learning, it's by your pushing. Because art, great art, comes down to the individual. It comes down to the individual, the knowledge, the talent, the life, the, the hard work. You gotta be willing to do the hard work. And you have to earn it. Because if you don't truly earn something in learning, it's not yours. And you don't understand it anyways. You can't give it to somebody, they have to understand it in their own way. And that's what true learning is. And that's what we're trying to give people but they have to accept it, and they have to learn it. And I was lucky, I, I had some really good teachers, and then I studied it myself too. Like I always said, I went to art school at uh, Prince Rupert Library. That's where I went to art school. And I just studied people I liked. I didn't, if I didn't like them, and if I thought they weren't truthful, I, don't, I didn't read them, I didn't study them. But I wanted, to, I, I, I studied sculpture and I studied our history too and our stories and our, our songs and our, and, and I was lucky that I, I met certain people in my life and, and I listened and I, I had this, I was born into this family and, and of artists. And I was lucky too that uh, my mother told me stories and my, my family supported me and and all, all the things that I did, my brothers and my sisters, and, and I was lucky that um, Frida came along when she did, because after that, she changed my life, she changed, changed my whole, what I was gonna do. And I was lucky that um, she was a great teacher, because teaching, there's, it's an art form too. People know stuff, but they can't teach it. Great teachers have a certain gift. It's a gift. But art's a gift too, but it's a curse too, because you gotta live it. You gotta do it. It's like people are gonna go shopping on Saturday. I gotta go carving. You gotta do it. That's a difference. A true artist, you have to do it. There's no other way. And that's what I mean, and you gotta live it too. And I was lucky, you know, like, this is a story I tell my students, you know, that uh, there was a lady, she was outside of Penn Station, and uh, she was asking this policeman, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? You know what he said? He said, practice. <laughs> and that's what you gotta do in art, too. <laughs> and this other one, too, this guy, you know how people are always waiting for their boat to come in? He said, well, if your boat doesn't come in, swim out to it. <laughs> And that's your knowledge, that's your learning, that's you, all the things you gotta do for yourself or you're never gonna get there. And that's some of the things that I, I live by and I've done, I, that's what I teach and, and I do and I, 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 I think art is, um, we call it the magnificent struggle because that's what it is. It's frustrating, it's hard, it's, you don't know why you're doing it sometimes and you don't know why you have to do it, but I have to do it, and that's part of my gift. And I think about myself now, like I wanna, I wanna do what I really know. And in life, you only do, you only use about 10% of what you know. I'm trying to use what I know now. I've been busy learning all these things over these years, just learning all these things. And I actually learned by teaching, like from my students, giving my students projects. Like I'd, I'd teach a spoon class and I'd make them do 20 different spoons. So by the time we leave, I know how to do 20 different spoons. Plus I'd learned from those spoons, so I know how to do another 20 different spoons. Because I figured it all out in my mind. I'll, I'll figure it all out. And that's what I do. <clears throat> that's what I do when I draw. I'm figuring out, I draw like a sculptor. I'm figuring out designs, how things fit, how things work. 
how the lines go, scale, the movements, forms. There's so many things like like I I've I've been to a lot of different museums all over the world because I love art. I just love sculpture. And I love to learn and I love to because that's why you, you should look, to really look. Because there's so much there, there's so much, so much to learn, so much to share. I I um I did about um like I've, I've been to Europe about eight times. And I've been to Japan about three times. And I've been to New Zealand nine times. And I'm trying to quit now, it's too far. <laughs> Though it's time, eh, like it's a time, it takes a lot of time to get there. And then I wanna be working. I think about my time is valuable because you only get so much time. And I've been lucky, like, and uh, I got to do my work. My work calls me, so. And what I was talking about, the, the land, where, wherever you live, affects the way you are, who you are, the way you see, the way you think. The land is spiritual to us. That's why we live there. That's why we teach there. It's, it's our home, too. And. Those things inspire me. And you gotta find things that inspire you, that really inspire you, and things that work for you. Like myself, the teaching gets me going too. Gets my mind going. And also the the drawing. I draw all the time. It's um it's an exercise for me now, like, like if I get an idea, I'll sketch it down really fast. I'll try to get the essence of it. And then I could always develop it. I always think I could make it better. I could always get it better. And when I do these things too, I forget them. I, I try to forget the pieces that I've done, I forget them. Because what happens is they'll come back and I don't show my pieces in my house because they come out, the those images will come out in my new things somehow, and it affects me. It affects me, those things affect me, so I, I just, I don't show them. And then what I do now is I, I hide them, or I put them somewhere else. Anyways, things affect you, and you have to find the right things, so. What, what I did was I, I, I know what I like, and I know what I'm looking for. And then I'll, I'll go there. I'll go there and I'll search. I, one of the best times of my life was teaching in Alaska in the 80s, because people just wanted to learn. And we shared so many good things, so many things. And, and that's how I actually done my homework, by teaching. And that's why Frida was smart. She was smart because she made me do it. And she knew I had to do it and I'd have to do my homework. <laughs> and I did. Because, you know, to really mature as an artist, you have to do your homework and you have to know your, you have to know a lot of things. You have to know more than a university professor of art. And our school, like our school, the Frida Deasing School, it's a really unique school because uh, we're real artists. I mean, we're really practicing, working artists. And we've carved all these things we're talking about. We've carved them, we've made them, we've taught. So that's why our school is so unique. And it's a really, I think about it now, it was Frida's dream. And we're living it and we're doing it. And I just want to ask you if you got any more questions you want to ask any questions, I, I'll try to answer them, because I think I talked enough. <laughs> I got a whole bunch of other stuff to tell you, but we don't have much time, I don't think. Yeah. Is there any questions? You got any questions? Um,
way the natives, uh, the way the people started to carve, uh, essentially? <laughs> you mean the oval shape? Yes, yes, your form line. The, the, because you're on, in your mask, you had eyes done in a, in a very traditional, ancient, flat form line style. And you have developed your own hooded eye style that is more sculptural and not flat. And I'm wondering where, uh, where you think that the, that the ancient form line style, which is shown now in, 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 in two dimension on, on your, uh, on your uh, houses and elsewhere, but where form line originated. Big question. I just wanted to know your, your opinion of where the line, uh, sculptural and lines came from, that style that's so unique to the West Coast. Nowhere, no, seen nowhere else in Africa or, or anywhere. Yeah, that's... Aside from, <coughs> aside from the Maoris. Yeah, that, that, that form line style, it's, it's really unique. It's, um, I think, what I've studied, it comes, I think, from the... If you go way, way back, and you know the petroglyphs? The petroglyphs had some beginnings of that. The forms, the really old forms. And those, those are really, really, really old. And then the painting style came. But I think it came from those stone petroglyphs forms, and then there were some shapes in nature too. Like see, like some shapes to us, they're spiritual too, but we don't really talk about them, you know, but that form, it's a spiritual shape to us too. And we use them for certain, like for the eyes and for the joints, and they were like energy in them too, and spiritual power in those forms too. Which all comes from nature, right? It all comes from nature, yeah, yeah. But I think it developed through the carving. The form line had to develop through the carving. Which, I'm sorry, which was abstract because I've never seen any, any uh, hyper realistic 10,000 year old Haida or West Coast native carved in wood that wasn't abstracted and that or married another thing with tools. That's a big question. We'll, we'll talk later. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty tricky too because like, you know, like when you talk about it, like the abstraction, there was all great art forms, actually they move into abstraction. And Northwest Coast was already there, you know, like in the bent boxes, in the designs, in those traditional flat designs, that was all abstract. And some of the forms that we don't know, we don't know what they, what they are because they're so old that all the people are gone, you know, that from that time, you know what I mean? So a lot of those things, like, like those shapes, we don't know where they originated or where they came from, but they came, you know, they're, our style is from the north. You know, the northern style is the Tlingit, the uh, Haida, and the Simsian. That's considered the northern style. And our style comes, you know, originally they, they painted on... Uh, they painted on hides. That's how the robe started. And then when they got the blankets from the paintings, they cut the applique and they got the cloth and then the buttons and used them. But you know, the abalone shells on the buttons too, those were spiritual to us too. It was a symbol of wealth too. And so when they got the trade buttons, you know, they went to town too because they could make so much more. They could do so much more. But they were always adapting the art forms. They were always adapting and changing. Because when you think about it, like innovation at that time was survival. Like say in the canoe technology, if you don't make it proper, you're gonna die. That's it. And a lot of those things depended on it. And you gotta know your trees. You gotta know the trees. You gotta know how strong that tree is. You gotta know so many different things. Thank you. Any more questions? Here, dancing. 
over here? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering uh, at what point does the mask become alive and, and, and an entity onto itself? What, for me or for... <laughs> uh, that's what I've been trying to do all my life. <laughs> I think it's in the finishing. It's got to be finished proper. You gotta, you gotta push it so far, you know, and you gotta have, you have to know how to draw first. And it's like this, what I think about art is like this. You gotta have it in here. If you don't have it in here, you can't put it in there. It's like trying to give a child something you don't have. You have to have that knowledge and that feeling in here. Because art is like, it's a belief. If you don't believe it, if you don't believe in your work, you don't believe yourself, nobody's going to believe you. Nobody's going to look at you. And that, that's a tricky one, too, because I, I'm always pushing it. But I think it's at the end. It's at the end. You know, like when he starts to look back at me, that's when I know he's done. And I just finish him, just leave him. Because who am I, I think about it like, who am I to judge him? You know, who am I? Because if you look at the old great mask, they had life. And that's what the modern art has seen in our stuff, is the life in those little carvings, those little ravens, little eagles, little masks and animals. Had great life in them. And that's what we've been trying to do as artists, is to put the life into them. Because art has to have life. It not only has to have life, it has to have power, too. It's got to it's gotta have its own power. And, that, like, how do you do that? Like, when I was in Copenhagen, I, I liked the blues. I, I just loved the blues, you know, because it got sold. The blues got sold. And anyways, these guys took me to this Mojo Blues Bar, they said, and so I went there. And there was these Danish guys, the blonde guys, playing really good technically good, but there was no feeling, you know. <laughs> I thought, what, you know, and I thought, something's wrong here, you know, and then I realized there's no feeling. And that's what I mean about the blues. You got to know how to play, you know, you got to live it. Otherwise, you can't play the blues. That's how artists do. You got to live it, and then you can play, you can, you can do it. That thing is like finding yourself. You gotta find yourself and your own truth and your own style and your own art. And you gotta make it real. And that's the challenge of an artist. That's the challenge. Like it sounds simple, but it's hard. It takes a whole lifetime. And that's what the drawing does. That's what the, myself, I think it's in the finishing. You gotta finish proper. It's gotta be the best. Our traditional way is like this, like we're, I'm from the wolf clan. When we show our traditional things, it's got to be the best. That's what we say. My grandmother said, if we're going to show our face, it's got to be the best. And because that's who we are. That's who we are. And so that's why our art was such high standards, very high standards. Because that's our face, it's our family face, and it's our clan face. And that's why we pushed it. Artists try all their lives to get the life into it, and power into it. And that's what I've been trying to do all my life. But I find at the end, you know, like myself, I've done a lot of work. I realize it's like this. If you're a painter, you gotta paint. <laughs> or you're not a painter. And if you're a sculptor, you got to sculpt, or you're not a sculptor. That's it. And you got to do it, and you got to do it hard, and learn, and do your best. Try to always do your best, because art comes down to the quality, the integrity, the belief, the knowledge, the spiritual, the the habits, the lifestyle of the individual. That's what it comes down to. Because 
That's what you got to give. That's what you got to give. You got to find it in him somehow. And that's what I've been trying to do all my life. Just through the art and doing it. And what I realized myself, like if I didn't carve all those things, I'm never going to get there. I'm going to get, I'm going to get somewhere, but I'm never going to get there. So I got it carved all those things just to get a chance. And what I feel now is at least, I feel like I'm in the ballpark or close to the ballpark anyways. But I'm still way out in left field yet though. <laughs> so I was lucky though, just to get that far. Any more questions? Okay, I'm going to do a couple of our songs, and that's going to be it. I got a couple of pieces. Uh, I got, I brought a couple of pieces. You could take a look after. Thank you, Dempsey. Um, just a reminder that in room 123 at 4 o'clock, there's going to be a guided mindful meditation. Um, so that's for anybody who wants to finish the day in a quiet way. Thank you. <laughs> 